Did you know that over 60,000 new tracks are uploaded to Spotify every single day? That's a new track every 1.4 seconds, and that's just on one platform. With so much music now available, it's more important than ever to stand out from the crowd. So it's not surprising that more artists are starting to use less conventional sonic textures in their music, like field recordings. Perhaps you've always wanted to infuse the sounds of nature or your favourite city into your own tracks, but not having the right gear or knowledge might have held you back. Well, if that's the case, you're going to love the brand new guide I just created, teaching you how to start field recording with just a smartphone. And it's all yours for free at femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel. Yep, you really do just need a humble smartphone and some minimal extra gear that doesn't have to break the bank to get started with field recording. And I've laid it all out in this handy five point checklist. So download it for free at femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel and elevate your music to the next level. It makes me so sad because I hear it so much with other women who want to make music just for whatever reasons they may be, and it is men, sadly, telling them that they need someone else to do it. We did a listening party for The Art of Losing the week it came out on Twitter, you know, to Tim Burgess's listening party, and I think I got a little bit carried away in the emotion of the moment. I remember while we were broadcasting, it went to number one on iTunes, and I just had a moment of, to the person that told me, let's see how far you get without me. Suck on this, mother... Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Okay, so you know how I've sometimes referred to girls twiddling knobs as the girls' toilets of music technology that you never knew existed? Well, I don't think we've had an episode that embraces that ethos quite as much as this one, because today we're getting into some real talk, ladies. I'm joined by the critically acclaimed multi-instrumentalist, producer and songwriter, The Anchoress, aka Catherine Ann Davies. And what I love about this podcast is that here, guests like Catherine feel comfortable enough to give us the real scoop on making and releasing music. Now, inside today's episode, Catherine candidly shares the experiences that led her to seriously invest in the skills, gear and home recording space necessary to take ownership of how and with whom she makes music. In fact, doing so has meant that her latest release, The Art of Losing, was largely recorded by her from her house and totally self-produced to boot. Naturally, I had to get Catherine on the podcast. The Art of Losing counts Elton John as a number one fan, has garnered sparkling reviews from Enemy, Mojo and countless other top music press, and was listed as one of the Sunday Times' albums of the year. Not bad, eh? But before we kick things off... I just want to flag that this is a full, frank and honest conversation and there are some naughty words. So if there's little ones around, you might want to stick in some headphones. But this is a discussion you're probably unlikely to hear anywhere else from an artist who has had such an incredibly successful year. Okay, let's meet Catherine. So Catherine, aka The Anchoress, um welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs it is so wonderful to have you here oh thank you for having me I'm so glad to get you on because we've got so much to talk about today I mean we could talk for hours um but there's some really important stuff that we're going to cover to do with carving out your own space what that's meant for you um in terms of recording production having more freedom as a woman in music and the wonderful music that you've made as a a, a, 
as a result and in particular your incredibly successful album the art of losing um but first what i would love to chat about is how you got into um how you got into recording and production in the first place, because a lot of the time as women who sing, it can be very easy to get typecast as just a singer or just a singer songwriter. What gave you the impetus to start getting into production and twiddling knobs? Well, for me, really, it was the production and recording first. I had never really wanted to be a performer. Um, So I think everybody who's followed my interviews by now knows that the story about um, the driving lessons versus multi-track conundrum that my parents kind of offered me when I was 18. So it was for my 18th birthday, I got to kind of choose what my present would be, um, but my parents couldn't afford to um, couldn't afford to give me driving lessons as well as, as to buy me a multi-track. So I had to choose between them, and I still can't drive. So I think from quite an early age, I knew that I was interested in recording and capturing sounds. Um, I wasn't one of those kind of typically, you know, jazz hands, shavers type kids at school. You know, I was quite shy and, uh, you know, I didn't sing in front of my boyfriend um, who I was with for a really long time for my teenage years. You know, I wasn't a kind of natural performer to the point that people didn't really know that I wanted to do music. It was something I kept very quiet. But I was also very interested in how records were made. Um, so I would always sort of scour, you know, the, the kind of CD booklets and, you know, look at who recorded what, who played what, who mixed the record. It was producers and, and engineers that, that kind of fascinated me. So I got my first multi-track. I think my mum and dad bought it secondhand from there's a music shop, I think, out towards Stevenage. <laughs> I think my my dad um, is quite interested in sort of valve technology and had always been quite encouraging of my interest in guitars. So I think he was quite thrilled that I wanted to start, you know, capturing sound as well. Um, and so that's where it began really for me. Um, and then the next big step for me was to, to get Logic, which I think at the time was about 100 quid, um, and just taught myself how to use it. And the first track I ever did was a cover of a friendly fire song called Paris and it got played on Radio One. So that was the very first thing that I did in Logic. Um I really eschewed the idea that I needed to learn from somebody who knew what they were doing. Um and it was just very much I've always been very kind of an autodidact, I guess. So teaching myself, working it out of myself, I felt very comfortable doing that. Um, And then when I did eventually make that shift into professional studio environments, I realized how right I was in doing that because immediately I always felt embarrassed to ask a question as if I was um, just really awkward and didn't belong there. You know, I was the only woman in in those environments. Um, And I feel very grateful that I had kind of made those strides early on to teach myself because I'm not sure I ever would have started had I just have been in studios. I think I... I just would have been too terrified. Yeah, it's a really good point that, you know, where that journey starts is so important and the environment and the messages that you're getting. And if you're starting in your own space, I mean, some people would find that very different. But for you, if you're getting that kind of positive experience in your own space, it's so positive that it gets played on Radio 1, the first track you make, that's a very different kind of entry into if you just come to music technology because you were asked to sing on a track for somebody else and you go into a studio and that can be so intimidating well it gave me a little bit of cash I think in that studio environment because there was a lot of kind of you know taking the piss and sort of strange sexist comments and I think reminding myself constantly and sometimes saying it out loud to them you know I'm here because I've already done this and I did it myself and you liked what I did on my own so shut up and let me take the desk that really helps I'm not going to say it was always it was always a kind of smooth continuation of confidence building because there were a lot of bumps in the road but it definitely helped to remind myself that I was there and I had been asked there because of what I had achieved on my own and Mm. what they had heard that I had done yeah it's very interesting though isn't it that even though that is why you'd been invited in you still felt that in that environment you still felt that kind of sexist um patronizing or 
even humiliating comments. Well, it was hard not to. I mean, we had sessions and things like that. I remember there was a string session once that I, I was working on and the, the guy that was engineering was, you know, on the short back mic going, oh, I'd fuck her, you know, I'd fuck her. And, I, and I'm sitting in the control room with them. They know, not only can I hear it, but the, the string players can hear it. And just the way that that was just accepted as okay behaviour, um, we're not talking about microaggressions here or just, you know, insinuations that you don't belong here as a female body. It was, it was expressed vocally out loud repeatedly. Mm. Um, with the constant sexist and sexual innuendo. Um, and you have to be, well, I had to be quite tough to make it through that. And I look back and I, I, I with a certain amount of regret that I put up with it. But, you know, when you're, you know, in your early 20s and you, you don't really feel that you've got the kind of the cultural um, authority, I guess, to stand up to. It's like, what would I have done? said yeah. this is disgusting and walked out and never gone back um and there is that horrible kind of coercion of having to just pretend to be one of the lads and put up with it I wouldn't mm. do that anymore and I don't do that anymore but I am in a very different position now mm. yeah and I think that's a really hard decision that so many women have to make and I know for me like I think I did a lot of the time walk away from opportunities because I just couldn't I can do that. And, and I, and sometimes I regret that, you know, because obviously that's, that is, that was the industry at the time. Um, even if it's changed slightly now and like well, you say, well, know that I regret staying as well. So I don't yeah. win. <laughs> no. And that's it. I don't think you can win. And I think it was a big reason why I never kind of flung myself at the music industry, even though my own music has done incredibly well in a kind of DIY scene way. Um, well in a commercial way but I never flung myself at the industry because any any of the whiffs I saw of that just turned me right off and I just I didn't want to be in that environment it's why I went down more a more kind of experimental route in terms of you know PhD and academia and all that kind of stuff professionally Um, but you're not the first person to say you wouldn't you wouldn't stand for it now, but at the time, especially as a younger woman, it's really hard to know what the other option is. It it is, and, and I don't feel that it's gone away either. I think it's it, I still see it present in the industry in so many different areas, in more insidious ways. Even even down to you know most recently over this last year, I've still had even though the first line of the press release for the album was you know written and produced by Catherine and Davies, that I'd, I'd have people congratulate the guy who mixed on the album, with, on the production, or people ask me who wrote the songs, even at my own label at the time. So and I sometimes feel that those kind of microaggressions are much more, um, not hurtful, because that sounds as if you're taking it personally, they're much more destructive, um, especially in the wake of any amount of success too, because it sort of feels mm. as if you are railing against an impossible tide. And I and I think that the message and the takeaway that you, you get from that is it doesn't matter what I achieve, it doesn't matter how much success I have, it it won't change. And that's almost yeah. worse than those early days when I think you still have some hope, you have some idealism, you think, oh well, I put up with this for a little while, and then when X and Y happens, I'll no yeah. longer have to. And and I guess the really depressing conclusion that I've come to is that not much changes actually. It yeah. doesn't matter what you've achieved. I I completely agree like my my uh sort of example of that in a different setting is that even though even though I have a PhD in sonic arts from one of the top three sonic arts research centers in the whole world and I'm in a music production department teaching music production on that faculty in front of music production students and I'm playing a track that I have produced I'm still asked do you produce music you know, and you just think, what do, what do I actually have to fucking do? <laughs> well, we have to change society's unconscious bias. I mean, it, it yeah. kind of starts right from children, doesn't it? You know, when children are asked to name, um, give names to um, 
you know, police women or police men or a mechanic yeah. in a classroom and they still gender them at that early age. Yeah. It is just this unconscious cultural bias that we all hold. And I think we even hold it ourselves. Oh yeah. To some extent. It's... No, we really do. We really do. Because I think still as women in like, you know, in the setting of girls thrilling knobs, still as women doing things with music technology and production and mixing and all those things, it's still surprising. E- you know, even though I've now talked to so many women because of this podcast it's still often surprising to kind of see women doing this stuff in a, in a kind of subconscious way even. And, um, and I think the one thing I, I know, I totally understand why it feels so defeating and so tiring, but in terms of like me in that more kind of educational setting, going and, and being part of a community of women and starting a community of women in the podcast in the course that I run, all that stuff has just been a totally different experience. And I do believe that that is the way forward. It's just not um, an immediate kind of fix, um, especially if you're commercially releasing music. But I do, I do see hope and I do see change in that scenario. Like I love teaching in that environment and I never feel like I have to jump through everybody else's hoops to prove that I'm worthy of being there um which is the opposite of traditional education it's interesting and I think I'd agree with you on that and I wonder where that comes from my experiences I went to a a state grammar school but it happened to be an all-girls school and I absolutely loved that single sex environment And, and I guess I was sort of massively privileged to experience that as the norm to just I guess have that kind of period of time from 12 to 18 where it was just the norm that women's voices were not competing with Mm. other men and I think it was an awful shock to the system for me to then go back to a co-ed environment at university and beyond in the professional world where I hadn't really I guess evolved those skills to act as a woman was expected to and I've often yeah. been told, oh, you're kind of like a guy or you act like a man or you're one of us, aren't you, really? And I, I do wonder if it comes from just not having to had nego- ha- not having to had negotiate that as a teenager, yeah, so therefore yeah. not having kind of culturally silenced myself mm. or, or kind of learnt to be all of the things that women are expected to be. Yeah, I know. That's a really interesting point for sure, because I think, you know, I went to a just a state comprehensive and it was mixed and um, you definitely I mean, I I feel like I was pretty confident and I was pretty assertive and I was quite unusual in that I followed something that I really cared about as in music as a woman. But um, yeah, definitely that you grew up experiencing um, how how you can be expected to behave or how men can, you know, insist you behave and all that stuff. And then having to kind of rally against it. Um, I never was going to conform to what being a girl meant. And also I didn't really enjoy all girl spaces. I really didn't. And I think it's been really nice later on being able to kind of form or join all girl spaces that are not about, you know, makeup and sex in the city and etc cetera, etc cetera. which which sex and city person are you I don't have any fucking interest <laughs> in that at all <laughs> you know and I like the company of men I really do and I like the company of women I like people who I can you know talk about interesting things and have a, a laugh with I think it's interesting though because I, I do think that the industry has an agenda to kind of push this uncomfortableness around um all female spaces because it does encourage competition because it wants yeah. us to think of female as a genre i remember when i was first starting out my manager was having publishing meetings and he was being told we signed a woman this year already so that yeah. was, you, you know that was sort of like 2010 kind of time yeah. and it was still considered that female was a genre yeah um and it's only probably for me in the last four or five years that i've come to understand that that only benefits men and that only benefits the industry because they want us to be suspicious of one another they want us to compete with one another because that means we don't collaborate and we don't talk to each other and the moment that I kind of clocked that and started talking to all the women that I'd been warned off or told to be suspicious of or been told rumors about was one when I found out that we all had the same story about similar people and that 
there was a reason they didn't want us talking to each other because we would mm. begin to join the dots and that there mm. were men out there doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. But also that it meant that we weren't powerful together. And I, I think I feel hopeful in that regard that there's a transformation of this idea that, that women can collaborate together and not be competing for the same space at all. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember like, um, well, because we met through teaching at ICMP in London and I remember you, we had a phone call and I remember on the phone you saying, oh, Isabel, I, I'm making a point to listen to women's work, you know, because I've been thinking about this, what you've just been talking about, this competitiveness and being pit against each other. And you're like, and I've just listened to your album and I just wanted to make a point of like listening to you because it's so easy to just, yeah, like you say, kind of shut yourself off to other women because of that um yeah just that whole that whole culture around it and when you said that I was like yeah that's a really good point like I really I, I mean I I do anyway I kind of gravitate towards women who produce anyway but when you said that I was like you know I really have to be conscious of not just yeah like not not thinking oh I I won't listen to her stuff because maybe I'm in competition with them or maybe it'll just make me feel this or that do you know what I mean yeah I mean some you know all of my friends who are women who are making music who produce themselves you know none of us make music that is even remotely sounding anything alike we're in completely different genres yeah. doing obviously our vocals sound completely different some people aren't even using their vocals um and just this idea that who does it serve for us to be suspicious of one another and and, and to be in competition it usually serves the men um and I have become quite unashamedly and quite um, feminist about this is the only way to put it. And I, I think like you, I was quite suspicious of all female spaces maybe sort of six, seven years ago. And, and now I I see that that's an agenda that only serves to maintain the patriarchal imbalance. Uh, and I, I hear myself talking and think, if I'd heard myself say this, you know, as I say, five, six years ago, I would have been rolling my eyes. Um, really? Yeah, definitely, because I wanted to be one of the boys. I wanted to really? be... Really? I, 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 I sort of was prided myself on being able to pass in those spaces to mm -hmm. be like, oh, Catherine, you're a laugh to have in the studio, or you don't mind us, you know, making all these kind of sexual comments and, you're, you know, you're one of the blads. I did do you think pride myself on it. That's very interesting because you're so not like that now. And I've never known you, you know, I've never known you to be anything other than, you know, how you are now. And I, I'm wondering, do you think, but do you think that did help you with your career, with furthering your career? Absolutely not. No, because it only took me down really toxic routes. Right. Um, because ultimately I wasn't there as an equal. I was there as, we're not going into too much detail, um, partly because of people's uh, ulterior motives. Um, which I was blind to. So I have Asperger's or I am autistic, as, as I should say, as I prefer to say now. So I'm often can be blind to people. I'm very bad at reading people. And I wasn't aware of the, the motivations for having me in that space um, and the motivations for allowing me to be there, but only if I behaved in a certain way. Um, and as I started to become much more aware of my female power, I guess, um, if I stepped out of line at all, that was, that was punished within the industry and within that space. Um, I don't think there's been a massive change in me, but I think I pushed down what was naturally there, what had been nurtured in that all-female school space, because I thought that was the only way to be creative. I thought that I wouldn't be allowed to be in that space, which is probably true. I also think I, I, I probably naively thought that I could change minds from the inside as well. So I would often push the conversation towards, you know, you really shouldn't be saying that. And uh, look, I'm a woman and I'm here and you feel comfortable about me. So why don't you have more women in the studio? Hmm. You know, I, I wasn't kind of, um, I wasn't a lapdog in that situation. I was trying to disrupt from the inside, but I see that that wasn't perhaps the best tactic in hindsight well yeah but I mean in other in some situations it could have been and a lot of the time it's also those individuals in the room you could have been working in a studio with somebody that you really did change their perception 
and um and also i think you know it is a it is a process and we've got to try whatever we can try i mean i think i did change people's perceptions to some extent but it was so insulting the level at which their their preconceptions were kind of based you know i i would get reported back to me oh we worked on this session last week and x person was just so surprised at how good your ears were they yeah. were really surprised that you picked up on that phasing and it's like why? Because you think I'm a woman, therefore I can't hear things? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, has my hearing different to yours? Yeah. Uh, so I guess it, it really, the longer it went on, the more depressing I found it, that the bar was so low. But what I'm interested in, actually, Catherine, just hearing you speak, is because when I've experienced that, I then have to really work hard for it not to chip away at my confidence. Because I may have been quite confident going into a situation and, you know, knowing that I can hear certain things, pick certain things out in mixes and stuff. Then somebody saying, I was surprised that you could do that or I'm surprised you did that so well. It's really, I find it really hard. I have to work hard and like I, I now talk to myself to unpick that. But d d did that chip away at your confidence? Does that? Or do you feel like you're quite naturally sort of able to put that in its place? I don't, I think, again, I don't know if it's because of my neurodiversity and the way that I, I've never particularly had a problem with confidence because I'm very factually based. So I can look at something that I've done and know and feel assured that it is good and therefore that what other people call confidence is well-founded. And so I don't think I ever had that disrupted because I continued to make things on my own. I continued to be aware of the results of what I was capable of. It definitely had an effect on my mental health. It definitely had an effect on my sense of reality. I would, I would say that I experienced what we would now call to be gaslighting. Um, but it never affected my confidence in myself, although many people did try. I think, to make me feel as if I couldn't do something outside of the realms of a professional studio space or I couldn't do it without a big team. Um, and I think I especially feel, you know, I feel in a good place confidence-wise, you know, having made the art of losing because, you know, I did that pretty much alone. And I, even though I had to sit on that record for two years before it came out, it's like I knew it was good and I still feel like, that and that's quite rare for me to just feel a hundred percent happy with something that I've made and no one can take that from me yeah yeah which is a wonderful feeling and I think it's that correlation of, of the way I look at the world is quite sort of um black and white and it's just a correlation between okay well let's look at the evidence for the thing that I may be feeling so I I, I guess I don't have an issue with confidence because I always look to the facts um and I guess there is that external validation there for me to kind of what think, well, no matter what bad day I'm having, there's that external validation to know that I made something good. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. Yeah. I wouldn't say that I feel like a confident person. I guess I just don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. No, I get what you're saying. That you know, if you've gone through certain processes in the right way, and you can hear that something has worked, then you can you do you just know that it's worked. That's exactly it. For me, it's it's a, it's a case of I follow the process and I follow the journey. Confidence doesn't even come into the equation whether or not I feel good about myself or not. I just have to follow the process. Yeah. It's like a factory yeah. in my brain. <laughs> yeah, 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 which I, I can totally see is really, is really helpful when it comes to having, but well, but then you, like you said, there's the gaslighting thing. And I think that this is what I mean though, is that, I have, you know, I've done things before where I've had people tell me, you know, that they're, that they're very, very good, et cetera, et cetera. And one person can say, it, it's not, it's like a, it's like a toxic compliment sometimes. It's like, I really thought that you wouldn't be able to pull this off, but you did. Yeah. You know, like they, I remember um, showing a professor at the um, research institute I was doing my PhD in and I made a like a 15 minute multi-channel very complicated soundscape piece and he said to me I, I really thought that at that point you were going to do this compositional thing which would have been really bad and would have you know really let the piece down but you didn't and I'm like no I didn't because I'm not fucking shit 
<laughs> See, this is where having no filter really helps with my life yeah. <laughs> because I just would have said exactly what was going through my head, which was, do you understand how insulting that is? Yeah, <laughs> to yeah that's it. really good. That's really good. But for me, it's like, it's almost, the way I can describe it is it comes in like a cloud and the cloud sits there. And then after about a day or two, the cloud has lifted and I have clarity <laughs> in that situation. Yeah. You know, it's so frustrating. Well, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm in no way affected by these experiences either. I would say that my the lack of confidence has manifested itself through performance. So yeah. I grew up being a very confident performer and not ever having experienced stage fright. And I think the cumulative result of those years of experiencing this kind of chipping away at my confidence has only made itself known through this uh, a rising of stage fright. It's the only way I can put it. Um, so I haven't es- escaped unscathed. It's just no. made itself known outside. The studio is my space where I can control everything and I know I have a process. And if you give yeah. me the time to follow that process, I can create good work. A performance space, that's more precarious to me. I don't have the control over that in the same way. And over the past probably five years, I developed horrendous performance anxiety really which not a lot of people know because you think well I was in simple minds for five years playing arenas where does that come from so I I wonder if it kind of funneled itself in there instead um yeah so that that's where I guess my lack of confidence Mm. is is now well yeah and the thing is performances are very unpredictable you know you you can have certain processes but they will always you know there's always the chance they have to go out the window which is not necessarily the case in a studio. So I can understand why that would be, you know, more anxiety inducing. Yeah, and I think there's just certain things that have lodged themselves in my head over the years, you know, comments about, oh, well, you're not a trained pianist or you're not a trained musician. But, you know, like what you're talking about, like there's veils, a compliment that's actually not a compliment. Oh, yeah. And I think that has lodged itself in my psyche so that I see myself as someone who's not a musician. Mm-hmm. at all yeah. so yeah. when it comes to live that you know there's nowhere to hide is there yeah and I am I became trapped in this kind of anxiety loop about making mistakes on stage until a friend of mine said something to me she said okay Catherine what would happen if you went wrong on stage let's imagine that scenario mm. let's think about those artists that you've seen where the same thing has happened and how did you feel watching them and mm-hmm. it made me think about watching Rufus Wainwright on stage at the Royal Albert Hall and he made a massive fuck up in the beginning of a solo piano performance. Everyone loved it, absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And so I began to unstitch that, I think, through, I guess, a little bit of kind of cognitive behavioural rewiring, which was, okay, I'm concerned about making a mistake. What would happen if I made a mistake? What would be the impact? What's the worst case scenario? And let's follow that through. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not perfect. and I, I don't think I've completely erased that anxiety but I think realizing that perfection is not what's expected and no. place really helps yes and and I think also something that I think is very important is accepting that that performance situation that that is a lot of pressure you know it just is it's like if you're expected to perform at a high standard in any way but especially on stage it is a lot of pressure and I think like for me anyway I've often kind of um like minimize that in my head I'm like oh it's fine oh it's fine it's just you know it's just a gig uh, whatever but actually I found it useful to accept no this is quite an unusual thing to do like most people don't get up on a stage in front of hundreds of people and you know have to perform something to a high standard it with a spotlight on them like most people will never do that in their lives. It is quite a high stakes, like high pressured environment. Yeah, it's so strange because I didn't ever suffer with performance anxiety or simple minds at all. And I think down that was partly down to the fact we had a, an enormous team of technical mm-hmm. support and obviously incredibly talented bands as well. And I'm just part of that. I didn't feel as if I was kind of shoved to the forefront. I was just a cog in a kind of bigger machine. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I was habitually then used to that extreme pressure in front of thousands of people every night to the point where I just didn't get nervous going on stage at all but you take away that machinery you take away that support so it's almost like you've been an analogy would be you're used to recording in massive studios with great engineers and great players and then suddenly you're back in your bedroom doing it 
and you're used to all this support that's now been taken away. And I wonder for me whether that's partly to do with the shift in thinking around it is that I had begun to think that the only reason that I was good on stage was because of the support team. Okay. It was because yeah. I had this bubble around me to catch mm. me if something went mm. wrong or to cover mm. up anything that went wrong. Yeah. Um, not that anything ever did in how many, I think I did like 500 performances with them. And the only time anything went wrong was this technical issue. We did a show in um, Monaco and the sustain pedal on my piano broke in the middle of a solo. It was just me wow. on the piano. It was humiliating. I came off stage oh, and God. cried. Um, oh no. Although heartening that the the keyboard tech was just as upset as I was. Oh, yeah. Re- it was really, I mean, it didn't in the short term kind of make it sting any less but I was just I felt as if I'd let the band down because I hadn't been up up to par I mean obviously you know you're always going to have problems where things go wrong but I think that perhaps was the beginning seed of me feeling I'm only good because of the team because if something Mm -hmm. goes wrong Mm -hmm. I will Mm -hmm. do something like that where I have to play without a sustain pedal which everybody knows will sound terrible (laughs) (laughs) but we digress slightly from recording yeah 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 but I guess I just wanted to illustrate that you know I'm not saying that I you know I'm supremely confident person I think it's just made itself known in other areas and the production and recording is is sort of my my safe space Mm -hmm. yeah well, okay. Well, speaking of safe spaces, I know that it was really important for you to start um, putting your own space together at home. And I just wondered, how did that come about? What were the motivations? And how did you start that? Well, I made the first album, Anchorette's album, Confessions of a Romance Novel. It's mostly in professional recording spaces. Um, although I did record all of the pianos in my flat at the time and some backing vocals. The majority of it was done and relied upon having access to those spaces. So in downtime, for instance, um, or in a small production room. So I was very much kind of enthralled to and reliant upon the goodwill of other people, which became quite a sort of toxic dynamic is the only way to put it. Um, Can I just ask, just for context, was that, were you signed by a label? Um, no, so the entire okay. album was self-funded. Okay. Um, I've only ever licensed my finished records to a label, so I'm responsible for the, the entire cost of making them. That includes the mixing and mastering of them. Okay. Um, so that was a huge endeavour to do the first album. It took around four years. Wow. And I was working three jobs at the same time, and mm-hmm. it was all done, as I say, in snatches of downtime. You know, some yeah. weeks I might do one or two days a week. And then there might be, you know, nothing for months after that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really tricky. And, and I think by the end of that process, I just realized that I couldn't mentally put myself through that again. Yeah. It, it was just draining for so many different reasons. Um, and, and also that I wanted to return to what I had started doing, which was doing it myself. I'd given over too much control to other people. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you don't have to go into too much detail, but what were the what were the things that you'd found difficult about that process recording the album in that way? I mean, the at the worst end of the spectrum, there were days when I was banished from sessions. So I I was told that I wasn't allowed to come to a drum session for recording for some of the tracks because I said something in an interview that displeased the person that I was co-producing with. Okay. Um, it was it became a really just an unhealthy working relationship. Um, and, and even down to just, you know, I, I lived in South London at the time. The studio was in West London, so it'd take me nearly two hours to get there. And there was just one too many days where I would track all the way there only for the, for the other people not to turn up. So I would mm. be sat outside of the studio, not able to get in, not able to do any work. And I just remember that happening a lot to the point where I would end up just calling my boyfriend at the time in tears and just just exhausted with the the hope of it all and the really you know I desperately wanted to make this record and therefore I sort of felt as if I couldn't really what's the word um I couldn't complain about anything and I just sort of had yeah unprofessional behavior (laughs) Um, yeah it's it's a lot of uh, like power that's taken away isn't it yeah and in hindsight that was done for a reason I mean that's not to say there weren't some really great memories you know, making that record. And I learned so much as well 
yeah. having access to those professional spaces and working with assistants and engineers that I never would have met otherwise and just soaking up all that knowledge. I did a lot of note taking, watching mm. what people were doing, asking questions, being that annoying person that's asking how everything works. Um, yeah, so uh, when it came to album two, I was in this real sort of quandary about how to do it. And though I did end up recording the drums at, at a professional studio space, the majority of the record um, was made in my room here, um, in my attic room, um, by which point I'd accumulated enough gear to do that. So I had my kind of vintage synth collection. I'd been lucky enough to be able to, to afford to buy because I'd been working in Simple Minds for a number of years by that point. I had all the microphones that I needed that I'd accumulated over the years. Um, and I just, it was really a process of discovering the joy that I had in recording that I'd had when I was starting out as a teenager um, because I'd lost that massively. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those two processes for um, Confessions of a Romance Novelist and the Art of, of Losing, do they feel very, very different then? Incredibly different, yeah. yeah. I mean, one was massively protracted, by virtue of the fact that I wasn't a full-time musician. Mm -hmm. Confession, uh, Confessions was made, over say, about a four-year period, um, whereas The Art of Losing, really, in a condensed period of time, was was probably only about six months of very intense recording. Mm -hmm. um, although, as I say, it was then sat on for two years. but um, And it, it was just, you know, I was entirely in control of what happened and when happened and who else I brought into that space as well. Mm -hmm. As I say, it was quite a personal record to make. And I think, although it wasn't a conscious decision at the time to not allow anyone into that personal space, I think I was probably intuitively realising that I couldn't have made that record talking about some very you know, deep trauma with anyone else in the room. Um, yeah. That's a really important point because I can definitely relate to that, that I found recording by myself one of the most therapeutic cathartic healing experiences but I couldn't have done it if someone was watching me at all it would you know the work would have been so different um and also I I know lots of other women you know some of the students that have gone through my course home recording academy say, say exactly the same thing um that, that it allows you to make work that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily make with other people yeah there uh, which is not to say that that you know as, I want to be clear that there were spaces where there were other people in the room so I had um I think in total three or four days of drum sessions at Conk and I had an engineer there with me mm -hmm. um Scott who I'd worked with previously um I then took those um drum recordings away and everything was comped Mm -hmm. and edited myself away from that space but again when I was doing string recording that was done in a um, professional studio space as well so mm -hmm. there were times where I needed to step out of that kind of cocoon yeah um but I was going back into those shared spaces having done the legwork and I, re I remember you know, one of the engineers dub that worked on the string session saying to me just always being surprised at how much I'd done since he'd just last seen me and sort of joking oh well you don't really need much from me do you but again I was using that space as an educational space too knowing that here was someone who was you know a fountain of a lot of knowledge and wisdom mm. and really wringing him dry for all the things that I needed to learn mm. um, you know I, I'm definitely I don't think I'm an arrogant person and that I always see music making as an opportunity to learn new things from whoever you're with um, yeah so, so I really kind of um he had been a mixer for um, Spike Stent. So, you know, one of the top mixers in the world. He'd been his assistant for years and then gone on to to mix Bjork and The Cure and Birdie. And, he, you know, he's an incredible mixer. So I knew, I knew that there were things that I wanted to learn from yeah. him. I think it's about having that balance between knowing that you want to maintain your solo space, but reaching out where it's of value. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more like that's exactly the experience that I've had too. I think it's about having the choice. But to me, that is what we mean by empowerment through these kinds of skills for women. It's about having the, that choice. Um, and without that choice, you're, you're in a very different position. And like you say about your first album, you know, um, 
it can just feel so you can feel so powerless against maybe somebody not treating you well or not being pr- professional well i think it's um, just not an uncommon experience though is it because when you en- enter the industry often often the work that you're doing is is run on favors or kind of the never never or future possibility or future payoff for someone and that is yeah. just a really unhealthy dynamic that needs to be erased because wherever someone is doing something for free there's always a payoff somewhere totally and I I just think for women especially it's not a situation that should be encouraged because I just think it's much healthier when you are contracting someone to do a job and they know what they're getting paid for it and they Mm. know what is in it for them in terms of financial recompense Mm. equally I hate that that then excludes people from the process because you need Mm -hmm. money to do it yeah but I hear so many experiences like mine of records made sort of with favors or understandings where then things turn sour because the two parties don't necessarily agree on what was agreed Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard horrendous stories of records being you know kept hold of by people I I just if I could give one piece of advice to anyone starting out it's just even if you have to save to make sure that you do it I mean I remember this same person that I worked with right back at the beginning was offering to give me their, um, they had a spare G5 Apple computer. And I remember just refusing to take it for free. I I said, thank you, that's very generous, but I don't feel comfortable taking that from you for free. Yeah. And borrowing the money from my parents to buy it from them. Because I guess I had some implicit understanding that nothing's ever free. (laughs) And, And it just was not a precedent that I was comfortable with at all. Yeah, definitely. I, I really agree. I think it's really good advice. And I and I would add to it also for anyone listening, it does not have to cost lots of money in the beginning. There are people who have made incredible music with just a laptop and a microphone. And you really don't have to be, you know, spending thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to get started. And at the very least, learn the skills that would mean that even if you do go into a studio, you feel confident and you have an understanding of what your boundaries are and your vision is and what what you need to be looking out for, even just, you know, investing in that on the very basic level will massively, I believe, transform your confidence and your opportunities and your agency. And it reduces your costs. I mean, the second album, yeah. The Art of Losing, costs on paper way less than the first album, In turn, although a lot of the first album wasn't, it was, you know, in in kind payments because it was you know downtime or whatever but because I recorded the bulk of it at home myself there really weren't the costs that were associated with going into professional spaces um so you know and having invested that time in my own skill set actually paid off in terms of not having to spend up you know my main costs were in the mixing of the record where I got external mixes in the drum sessions the string sessions um and the mastering that's it yeah yeah exactly and the thing is if you add all that up in terms of if you had gone into a studio to do everything in the album I'm sure that you are looking at thousands and thousands of pounds probably would have have saved 70 grand I would have in the amount of time that I took yeah and I think that's the other thing we don't look at it in terms of if you have a room of your own and you have a space Mm -hmm. of your own you are giving yourself a different creative process too because you don't have the time pressure you're not observed by anybody else you have the freedom to make mistakes. I think that creates a different kind of work too. Totally. Yeah, totally. And I think, again, you know, if you're dealing with, if you're writing about stuff that is personal as well, you have that freedom to experiment with stuff and like um, try something out, listen back to it, like actually listen back to it because you've recorded it and and think oh no that that's far too much like that's not quite getting what I'm getting at or that's that's too much that's too raw and it's it's going to give the wrong message and it's not how I wanted it to come across like you get to experiment and you get to like record things that maybe you you listen to in two days and you're like oh god that's so cringe but you get to do all that on your own absolutely I mean I remember for the first album you know it would on average probably take two two session days to comp a vocal so to edit a vocal take or vocal takes down with this is the other people that I was working with because we had to follow the process there was always chat and lunch and it wasn't particularly focused work whereas if I do that on my own I could probably get two tracks done in a day yeah and it's just I can work 
the way that I want to work. I don't mm-hmm. like to take breaks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it really wasn't shocked when they work with me like that. And I now have to actually prep people for that, just saying that I, I like to work. But I do think it's really, it's great because you've got these two different experiences that you can reflect on now and really kind of see with clarity how much, um, yeah, how much more control you have now over that process, but also that, of course, you still collaborate with people. Of course, you still outsource certain parts of the project, but you choose when that is the right time to do that. And you have, and I think because you have, lots of equipment but also just lots of skills that you've you've grown over the years um you can make really informed choices about who you work with yeah and I look back now and I feel so sad for the opportunity that I could have had with that first album to make more of an album that was the way that I wanted to make it because you know I had the skill set to do it and I I, I just didn't, and we go back to your question about confidence. It's like, actually, probably I didn't have the confidence to see it through. I, I felt like society had told me that I needed a group of people to make a record with, that I needed men to do it with, that I couldn't yeah. have done it on my own. Whereas in hindsight now, I see how slow it was to do it like mm. that because mm. it wasn't honouring my process, because it wasn't honouring my vision. It was always compromising and diluting what I wanted to do and I hope that people can hear that on the results of the two albums as well that um you know the art of losing is so much more focused I think and so much more I mean the reviews I hope speak for themselves Uh, yeah yeah, that objectively people think it's a better record and I I feel quite vindicated in that regard because I think I was made to feel as though I couldn't do it on my own I think I was told that I was told the immortal words let's see how far you get trying to do it on your own you'll come crawling back wow well you proved them wrong <laughs> for sure yeah we, we did a listening party for the art of losing the week it came out um on twitter you know tim tim burgess's listening party and i think i got a little bit carried away in the emotion the moment i remember while we were broadcasting it went to number one on itunes and i just had a moment of to the person that told me let's have see see how far you get without me suck on this motherfucker because yeah. I just felt so there's this mixture of anger and vindication around and it, it makes me so sad because I hear it so much with other women who want to make music just for whatever reasons they may be and it is men sadly telling them that they need someone else to do it and I, I just all those wasted years I wish I had learned earlier mm. You know, I never get those four years back. Yeah, but then also look where you are now. And I think that those four years gave you such a such a drive to do it yourself, you know, which is very important. Well, I've proven it to myself and I think to other people now that I look what I can do on my own. And I think now I feel kind of freed from that need to prove anything. And I think I will definitely go back to more freely collaborating now because I don't feel in the same way that people are going to be kind of whispering oh you know well she didn't actually do any of that or, yeah yeah and to, and to be honest it, look, look, having seen the way that you know people talk about records made by women anyway everyone else gets the credit regardless of not if you've done it yourself so it's yeah. just like what you know why make it much more difficult for yourself and lonely as well because it is lonely making a record on your own yeah so I is. think in the future there's a happy medium to be had between the two the right mm-hmm. collaborators you know healthy dynamics of people that you work with um and just yeah maybe I will be a bit more um a bit more sociable on the next album <laughs> Yeah, but actually it's something that I want to pick up on from um, some of the stuff you were just saying is that, um, you know, quite rightly feeling uh, rage about that, feeling anger about that and and a sense of kind of um, defeat maybe almost for as women that when you do when you do make really, really high quality work that even gets, you know, really great critical or commercial success people are still presuming or even kind of you know spreading the idea that you didn't do the work that you actually rightly did I know we've talked before that you you feel like you're kind of able to own that rage a bit more now is that the case I'm kind of paraphrasing yeah I mean it's it's, it's a righteous anger isn't it so I have every right to feel angry that I spent a year making a record alone and yet 
the men who mixed on the record get credited for the production. I have every right to be angry that people retrospectively say, oh, now we do realise that you co-produced the first record because they don't sound that dissimilar. Um, I have every right to feel angry that somebody at the label still asks me who I wrote the songs with. You know, I have every right. But I guess it's I laugh at the anger now because I know that it, that it won't change things. You know, as a society, I think we have a long way to go still. Um, and I, I think I also laugh at my own ambition within that because I think it's, I don't want to sound pessimistic in this way. I hope this kind of sounds almost like accepting that it, it's fruitless to think that you single-handedly are going to change things. Um, and I think you have to think about what's the payoff here. You know, is it, I know we've talked about this, you know, in our own kind of private time about the idea of you know is it worth the rage and is it worth mm -hmm. the angst that it takes through to make to make these records and I guess I'm in that yeah. space at the moment where I'm reflecting on whether it is worth it mm -hmm. you know you can have a top 40 record with across the board critical acclaim and it, I'm not sure that I feel any different to how I felt after making the first one I don't yeah. feel as if I necessarily have the respect from people I thought mm. something would change, but it mm. hasn't. Mm. Um, and it's not because it's not going to be just me doing that, producing and yeah. writing a record that's going to change that. It's, it's going to take maybe another generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think also picking up on what you're saying about, you know, you sort of laugh at the anger because you think, well, who was I to think I could single handedly change this? But I don't believe that you ever thought that. And I don't believe I ever think that. It's more that how can you how can you go through this life and not at least try in your own small way? That's just not an option for me anyway. I, I can't just go through this life and go through the motions knowing that to do that would just not be being honest or authentic about who I am. But I think all you can do is do what you enjoy in the way that you enjoy it. And I think that's probably the lesson that, that as my takeaway here is don't don't undertake to do something in a certain way because you think it will prove a point or you think that you will change people's minds. Yes. You should do it because it feels like the right way to do it. And I think that's perhaps why I'm saying I think in future I will be more collaborative because I yeah. think I was perhaps a little programmatically uncollaborative to try and prove that I didn't need anybody else. And it's like, okay, well, I've done that now. I've proven it to myself, but I don't think anyone else is listening. <laughs> so I may as well enjoy it. Yeah, it's so hard. It's so hard because um, I've definitely felt that before. I mean, I've basically been feeling that the whole way through, you know, making records and releasing them myself. And I've had this massive feeling of like, no, I, I have to do as much on my own as I possibly can, because otherwise people are just going to presume that I didn't do this stuff that I actually did, you know. And I think the older I've got, the more, well, no, I don't regret doing that as well because I, th I think you're between a rock and a hard place. Like we've t talked about before, you are, you know, as a woman um, stepping outside of what people expect you to do. But I also agree with you in terms of now I feel that I'm more confident, that word again, confident in collaborating because I'm not hopeful or expecting or anxious that I can change the way people might view my contribution or my worth or whatever. I know I just have to hold that inside myself. Yeah, I mean, a big kind of turning point for me was talking to Mario Minolti, who was one of Bowie's kind of long-term collaborators, and him saying to me, Catherine, because I was stuck in my hotel room in Australia when we were on tour, comping drums in Australia, I mean, for days. And he just said, do you think that Bowie sat and comped his own drums? So he was his engineer. He knows he didn't. He said, you know, do you think he second guessed? Well, if I use Nile Rogers on this track, yeah. or use Eno on this track, then people are going to say, well, Bowie didn't do it all. He said he knew where to put his creative energies. And he's like, if you try and do it all, you're not going to do your best work. Although yeah. I actually would perhaps refute that. I think that the most recent album is my best work. <laughs> but can I repeat that? Can I keep doing that? Yeah. Probably yeah. not at that level mm. with that amount of energy that it took. Um, and that really made me 
realize that it is a gendered issue because nobody ever said oh well Bo- David Bowie didn't yeah. produce and write everything on his own and play everything on his own um but I can't win that battle I can't change the way that culture perceives women mm-hmm. but I can take a leaf out of Bowie's book and think collaboration enhances a piece of work yes. and it makes it better um so I, I I try and be a bit more Bowie now when I think about mm-hmm. how to approach a project um, and I'm never going to sit there and comp all the drum tracks myself because, frankly, it's just fucking boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's like your time is an investment. So you've got to use it in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, sure. I'm probably never go back to Australia on tour again. And I missed seeing it because I was sat there comping drums for a project that I didn't even get credited on. As a mm-hmm. producer, that's another mm-hmm. side issue too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All the times that I've worked on projects and not had a contract um, that stipulates what the credit will be. And it's like I never get that time back. But the lesson I learned was invaluable, which was always get everything in writing. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, what I would love to just discuss a little bit as well is maybe um, the, the Art of Losing has been so successful and and it obviously is a wonderful, wonderful record. And I really urge anyone listening who hasn't heard it yet to go and check it out. Um, but I wondered, did you have any idea that it would be this successful, Catherine? Because there'll be lots of women out there who are making wonderful work and it doesn't always get picked up. And there's great, great albums out there that, you know, just get missed. In hindsight, what do you think it was about the way you released it or the the album itself or the stories behind it or the people that were involved that has meant that it's been so successful? I think it's about having a team that really believes in you and, and the external team that I had helping to promote the record had been with me for a long time. So Gillian, my PR, for instance, she worked with me since before the first record was released for free. You know, she loved what I was doing. She invested her time in me. And that loyalty has paid off because she knows me really well and she knows my story. So she knows how to kind of convey that to journalists to make them want to cover the record, to make them want to invest in the story as well. When I say story, I mean like the narrative around your project. Um, And I was able to have an excellent radio plug at this time, which helped break through at radio, but I obviously wouldn't have been able to do that without the tracks themselves. Mm. I think what made the difference was the confidence that I had in the work so I I was never 100% happy with Confessions the first album it was just a case of it taking so bloody long to make that I really just needed to sign it off and then it got licensed by a label um, and they had a two album option so I always knew that Art of Losing would have a home I knew that it was going to get released through a label um, so there was that not that pressure to be thinking about I guess, catering to a certain sound. You know, they didn't even hear the album until it was finished. Um, Mm. I assume they listened to it before they released it, but I have, I couldn't, (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't promise you that they did. Um, So it was just, I I guess, thinking about what I felt like your question was asking was just that I just focused on the quality of the work. I didn't have a timeline, so I didn't have a deadline. So I could spend as long as I needed to make sure that I was happy with it. Um, And I think that that speaks to people. I think if you make something that is real, Mm. and you make something that is not trying to follow a trend and is not trying to mimic what other people are doing, and is fully of its own universe, and I think it's quite an unusual album, you know, it goes from an opening instrumental string and piano suite through to, you know, kind of um, 80s vintage synth pop. You know, it's, Mm. it's quite... A hard sell, isn't it? <laughs> it's not something that I had preconceived of. And, but I think that that just really, the boldness of it, and, to, mm. you know, to have a central song about sexual assault um, and to be singing about um, death and miscarriage and in an unapologetic way, I'm not saying that no one's ever done that before, but I don't think anyone's doing it at the moment. And I I think boldness is something that people want. And I think as well, the timing of the release, even though it was sat on for two years when it did eventually come out, it was, I could not have foretold that it would be the week of Sarah Everard's killing. And Mm. I think it really chimed with the zeitgeist. 
people mm. were much more comfortable hearing about these uncomfortable things in that moment there was mm. an appetite for it so it was really just serendipitous but but I can't underline enough the importance of having a great team that really believe in your record mm. um you know and I, I carry those yeah. people through with me to the next album too so could you just um outline for us what what does that team look like then so I have um a PR so somebody who looks after promoting the record to kind of print press so to broadsheets mm-hmm. music monthlies etc and that's Gillian at Hall or Nothing who's been with me as I said since 2015 I have a radio plugger who will take the singles that we decide to radio um so to try and get those um played on the radio and also playlisted which we did we got um a C list and a B list at six music this this time around um and then I also have a regional radio plugger so they will go to the kind of the, the regional stations, um, which for me is really important in Scotland and Wales, for instance, where yeah. I have quite established audiences. Um, and they also have an online PR. So they came mm-hmm. courtesy of the label, the online PR. Mm-hmm. So they would work with the online publications. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anybody else I've forgotten. I think that's it really in terms of marketing and promotion. And then obviously the label had their kind of in-house mm-hmm. people. But retail was not open when my album came out. So we really mm-hmm. missed out. Mm-hmm on quite a big side of releasing Mm. the album but I would say that press was the most important thing on this record because you know there was a real story behind its making um and my press officer was just very sensitive to my boundaries about what I was happy to talk about and not talk about Mm. um and so were all of the journalists I spoke to as well um Mm -hmm. and and I'm presuming that you have a manager too so I have somebody that helps me out with management. I mm-hmm. didn't have a full-time manager on this project. It was really mm. me managing myself. Um, mm. My previous manager, Sean, um, he worked with me on confessions. Um, he now works full-time for Max Richter. So mm. he wasn't able to, to manage me in the same way and manage the project. So really it was down to me um, mm. to liaise with the label and the whole team. But again, that felt really appropriate because it was such a personal record. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, yeah it couldn't have been anyone else advocating um, mm. and that was a huge drain on my time in a way yes. much yeah much tougher even than making the record oh yeah no I mean this is the thing and what we've talked about before of making the records the the fun bit you know making the record is the not all the time there's work involved but releasing the record especially if you're doing it DIY or even half DIY that is work. See, I really know. enjoy that. They say I've always loved the business side of things. And I think that probably helps. I do enjoy it too. But at the same time, you know, it's it's also really hard if you don't hit goals or, you know, get the kind of get that wave behind you and you still put all that work in, which is always a possibility yeah I mean thankfully obviously I didn't have to experience that this time around but I certainly remember some of those frustrations from the debut album that it is very hard to get traction as they call it yeah when you've got no prior record to go on yeah um and I think it was there was a lot of planning involved you know there was six months up front from when it was coming out that we kind of hit the button on you know go right yeah here's the first track here's the first video exactly Um, I, I, I'm, I know that people have said from the outside it looked very well planned and like there was a clear system in place. I would like to say that I was across every detail, but a lot of it was just being reactive in the moment too. Mm. And and just I'm really sorry. I just I know that people listening because I always get questions about about releasing and stuff. But you know how you had a radio plugger, you had a, someone on PR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Did you also fund that yourself? No. So the contract that I had with the licensing label, um, I think I'm allowed to talk a little bit in detail about this. So that meant that they had a minimum um, commitment to to marketing spend. So that meant that they covered the cost of the radio plugger and of the PR. There was nothing left in the budget after that, though. Mm -hmm. Um, So so I delivered the finished record to Mm -hmm. them. Um, I would probably like to guesstimate that it cost around £30,000 for me to deliver the record if I included the cost of the mixing, the mastering, the session players, um, the hiring of studio spaces. I'm not sure I'm including in that my time, actually. So I just want yeah. to give people a realistic idea. Of and what, what, about the, what about the promotion? How much would that be on top of 
Um, I can't talk specifics on the fees because those are confidential, but I, I can yeah. say that the total budget for marketing, um, so you can do the maths, was £8,000, which is mm-hmm. not a huge amount of money mm-hmm. for a whole album mm-hmm. campaign. I mean, that's nothing well, yeah. compared to what most labels will spend. Absolutely. And the kind of re- the results that you got, you know, which are just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And you can um, always but- negotiate, you know, fees with... with mm-hmm. um, with people you know especially if you're doing an independent release or self-release mm. people mm. understand that um mm. i think but building a relationship with the people you're working with is more important yeah. and if you want to work with someone approach them way before you're ready to release mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. a year before at least mm-hmm. because people yeah. are busy their calendars are busy they may not be able to take you on if they've got a couple of big albums dropping at the same time yeah 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 no, that's really good advice. And I think, thank you for being so open about, you know, the process and also the finances involved. And again, it's something we've touched on a little bit when we talked before about how important it is to have your head in the numbers and to have a budget and, you know, really understand how you're going to make that work. Yeah. And I um, want to underline that I did not make money out of the release, you know, just, mm-hmm, just to mm-hmm. say that when you release through a label, the sacrifice that you make is that the label is taking in in my case 82 percent so yeah. i think there is a lot to be said for self-releasing that's certainly something that i'm considering now because it doesn't make financial sense to mm-hmm. for you to be the one investing in the making of the album the costs of making the record to then give away 82 percent of that to somebody that didn't put their neck on the line financially mm-hmm. and i think mm-hmm. that a lot of artists are finding that that the same I think it used to be that it felt like a failure to not be on a label but now I say the reality is actually you'd have to have a very good reason for them to be investing a significant amount of money in marketing and perhaps an advance for it to be worth your while to give yeah. away the work that you have done and that you have paid for um, yeah absolutely but you know every situation is different I think you just have to you know, I'm lucky in that I license them for, for a set period of time, so they revert mm-hmm. back to me. So the first album, for instance, reverts back to me next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm free to do with what I like that. So take it to another label or repackage it myself, do an ex- you know, extended edition. I think, you know, just be very canny if you are considering signing to a label. That Think about what it is that you are gaining because the, the landscape's changed a lot in the last few years and there is very little to be gained from a label that you can't get through employing a distributor third party or a label services third party and you're not giving away a hefty chunk of your royalties to do that which is not not to be down on labels you know labels have their places if you're looking to build a career and the label is offering you an investment in that so they're willing to put a good hefty whack down on marketing and development or recording costs yeah that's a different scenario um but I don't think it's once the kind of badge validation that it used to be. And I count myself in that, in that I I was very much enthralled with this idea that I hadn't made it, mm. quote unquote, mm. unless I was signed to a label. Mm-hmm. And how having been signed to a label, albeit on a licensing deal, I, I kind of think, well, I certainly would have been financially better off had I not done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think that also, you know, the time that we have been making music things have changed so quickly you know and I think like when I first started self-releasing in 2010 um Spotify had only just dropped you know it had only just become a thing it was it was yeah it was quite kind of looked down on to not be on a label and but it also you know there's so many glass ceilings there's so many closed doors um and and I think that also that just the the industry changes so quickly, and what worked two years ago, or what was a viable or financially or energetically viable system or strategy, changes. Um, which is one of the great things about music, I think, is that there's always kind of new opportunities opening up of like doing things differently and setting your own stuff up, and um, that's definitely something that I've always enjoyed about it. Well, in going back to this idea of a, a kind of uh, a female network as well, you know, so many of my friends who are artists have now moved away from labels to releasing through label services and they're doing so much better financially and now self-sustaining. And they've been on like big indie labels and have had horrendous financial deals out of that and have now gone to self-releasing 
and such, although, mm. you know, releasing through distributors and, and actually making a living out of what they do. Mm. And mm. you would think from the outside externally that they've been very successful, but that hasn't resulted in the, in the financial recompense for them. Yeah. And that's a very important thing to consider, you know, because like you said, you can have these ideas about what a professional musician is in the long run or even in the short term. Is that going to actually make a difference to how how well you can create work, how you can support yourself still still doing, you know, making music and um, and also holding those holding those rights, you know, and making sure that you've covered yourself. And like you say, reading all the small print, getting it all in writing. Um, and sometimes having those really hard conversations that have to be had. Yeah, looking back, looking back now, you know, if I'd have had that initial lump sum to be able to hire the team myself, mm-hmm. I would have been so much financially better off releasing it myself. Um, mm-hmm. You can say what path that would have led me down, but certainly financially, it would have been made much more sense. I mean, I've come at music backwards in that so when I was at uni I interned for Sony um for two years I wanted to learn about how the industry works you know I worked at a PR firm Mm -hmm. as well part-time I worked at an agent as well I wanted to know how everything works so I did my research in order to Mm -hmm. then apply that to my own career Mm -hmm. so I've come come at it with a you know a raft of understanding about the business side of things um Mm -hmm. you know I've really I've released other people's records before I released my own Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So I I saw all the mistakes that could be made and kind of took mental notes about that. Yeah. Um, so it makes me a massive pain in the ass to work with from a label's perspective because I know when they're not doing their job properly. Yeah. And by God, you know that I'm going to tell them when that they've done something wrong. Um, yeah. But you know they get paid. You know, every, every, yeah. everyone at a label gets paid a wage. Yeah. They get to pay their rent each month regardless of whether or not a record makes the top forty. Yeah. A musician doesn't. And, and that feels gross, grossly unfair if not everybody is pulling their weight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, again, it's really it's thank you for being so kind of open about that, because it's really I think it's again, it's really useful for people to to see the different ways that people go into music. Well, and... a lack of transparency only serves the labels and the people that don't want mm-hmm. you to have the knowledge to be able to do it yourself, because that serves yeah. them because they I think a lot of labels now know that they're redundant. Mm-hmm. the ecosystem I, I think we're going to have a very different landscape in five years time yeah 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 I agree um so to finish up um thinking about how you know you you have amassed a lot of gear at home you've you've built this wonderful recording space in your own house and one of your passions is vocal mics is that right well just microphones in general just microphones in general yeah. um and therefore, I know that a lot of people listening are are often kind of thinking, what is the best vocal mic for me to get? And I asked you, as someone who's very, very into this, um, to recommend three vocal mics and dependent on different tiers in terms of pricing. So give us the scoop. So first of all, the, the answer to the question of what's the best vocal mic is there is no one answer to that because it depends on your voice. So I have a particularly unusual voice and that it has a lot of kind of lower mid naturally so what people often go to for a female vocal which is a kind of beautiful vintage valve mic sounds not great on my voice because I don't need that there it's there naturally um and I discovered this after having spent about 12 hours in strong room studio one one night going through their mic cupboard testing loads of different beautiful mics on my voice only for us to discover that the U87, that classic pop microphone, with a lot of top in it, was actually the one that sounded the best with my voice. So I think it's really important to actually, if you can, try the microphone on your voice, if you're buying it for your voice, that is. Um, because everyone's is different, and you, have, you know what's going to suit one person is not going to suit somebody else. So at the very top of the price chain is the Neumann U87, which I have a pair of now because I use them not only as vocal mics that we used to use them on um, strings and piano as well now this is two and a half grand's worth of mics so obviously it's something that is aspirational rather than something you would start out with but I always talk about things as being an investment and I never think of it as money wasted if it's invested in a piece of mic of microphone or gear that's going to hold its value and you will be able to sell your Neumann in 10 years time probably for more than you bought it for 
Mm-hmm. Well, maybe not 10 years, maybe 20 years, because it would be vintage by then. <laughs> so it's not, you just got to think about it as putting money into a bank account that is a piece of gear. Um, so that, I do love my Neumann. It's what I use all the time. On my vocal, I, as I say, I use it on the grand piano a lot. Um, but I also recently invested in a pair of Aston Stealths, which I have permanently set up on my upright piano downstairs. I did an A-B test with them. There is not much between them, to be honest. There's maybe a little bit more top in the Astons. Um, but just for the convenience of having it set up all the time, because I hate setting up gear, um, it was worth it. Um, so they're worth looking into as well. If you like a similar kind of microphone, but you don't have the budget, Um Next tier down is actually my first ever vocal microphone, which is an SE Electronics Gemini 2, which is a beautiful dual valve microphone. Um, I got mine. Now, to buy them now, I had to look this up because I didn't realize how expensive they were, but I did not pay this for mine. To buy it now, it's just over a thousand pounds. But I got mine on an artist endorsement deal. So this is nearly. 10 years ago and I think I paid about 700 pounds for it um and I had used it in a session in the studio session I'd had with one of the co-writers that I do a lot of stuff with for other people Paul Statham so I'd spent a lot of time with this mic um before I decided to buy it and he just kept going god it sounds great on your voice god it's great on your voice he's like I've never heard it like that on someone's voice and we've probably done about five or six sessions before I decided to bite the bullet and contact them and just see and they had just some demo x demo mics so i was able to get it you know for half price basically um and it's still in my cupboard it doesn't get used as much as it used to because the neumann's kind of surpassed it but it's a beautiful mic also can use it um as a drum mic as well so it has versatility and then the last one i picked is a bit bit different because hence why i said not vocal mics necessarily so it's a coles 4104 vintage bbc commentators ribbon mic now this is quite strange i wish we could see a picture of it but it's basically like one of those lip mics that you kind of hold mm-hmm. up to your face um used for commentating on football games in you know wide open outdoor spaces um and i bought mine on ebay for like 80 quid um and i use it all the time for backing vocals wow um, and it just has this really interesting texture and it, without having to eq the bv straight away you have just a really different sonic profile um and it's i'm a big fan as well of just i guess sort of playful techniques in the studio things that feel fun um i always think of the studio as a kind of playground to some extent and like you want to access that kind of childlike side of your mind and i think there's something about grabbing a microphone that you can shove in your gob that feels yes in keeping with that, you know, equally like rewired a telephone receiver to act as a microphone as well. And although it didn't get used on the final recording, it led to me exploring an effect on a vocal that did end up in the finished recording. So I'm very much kind of like, I like tangible objects I can kind of grab and play with. So the Coles commentator mic was sort of part of that um, studio process, I guess. I say 80 quid, on ebay and i often will will grab kind of strange auction lots on ebay that have got sort of old ribbon mics um they can be a bit noisy but again i'm not necessarily interested in pristine recordings i'm interested in things that will add a different kind of sonic texture or mm. i think of it like colors palette colors so i don't want everything to be the u87 because it's gonna sound the same especially with my voice and if you aren't working with backing vocalists or different voices you want to introduce those different colors and something different to your palette and i do that through microphones having a lot of microphones for me is about having a palette of different colors that i can draw upon and i've still got my sm58 which i recorded a lot of my early stuff with in fact the vocal for confessions the lead track on the first album was recorded on my sm58 what was that was like 70 quid 80 quid i think they are still such a good investment you know and it just goes to show that you don't have to spend thousands of pounds to at the very least get started if not re- like professionally release music it was good so. enough for Bono. apparently he records all his vocals in the control room on an sm58 so if it's good enough for bono it's good enough yeah. for us 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's so much more important, as I know you're an advocate of this, to spend time treating your room with duvets or whatever it is yeah. than it is to buy an expensive mic. Because you can have a Neumann U87, but if your room sounds shit, it's yeah. not going to sound good. Um, totally. And even just down to buying, you know, a nice, reasonably cheap, Mike Pre as well. I've got a Golden Age that I started out with. What are they called? The Golden Age Pre seventy three, which is like a Neve ten seventy three copy. I had got a pair of those quite early on. I think I'm trying to remember how much they were. It wasn't maybe one hundred and fifty quid each. Like you know, not a massive amount of money. Yeah. Just for anyone who's not familiar with preamps, Catherine, can you tell us what um, you like about using them? So a preamp sort of gives color to the signal that you're recording. So obviously you will have preamps built into your audio interface. Um, so in, for instance, I recorded a lot using the Duet, Apogee Duet. It has nice kind of clean, very uncolored sounds. But if you want to add some character, so I have um, my go-to preamp that I use for everything is the Chandler reissue of the Red 47, which is about four grand, I think. But I use it on everything mm-hmm. because it has this enormous vintage color and character. Now, when I was kind of coming up through the studio system, I worked in a space that had a ton of need 1073s, which is just a very uncolored, pure, warm sound. So it's a bit like a filter that you put on your photograph. Your preamp will give a color or a character to the signal that you're recording. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're starting out, it, it's probably not important beyond just having something that's uncolored, something that doesn't isn't too harsh that is clean um that doesn't impose its character but once you kind of get to the point where you can afford to maybe have a couple of preamps you can add color to your sonic palette using those preamps so you've got the color of the microphone and you've got the color of the preamp so you're beginning to build a signal chain and then if you Mm -hmm. get really playful like i do you can add an additional color shade by then throwing that through outboard gear afterwards so that'll be things like a distressor or it might be throwing it out through a vintage like tape machine um so it's adding like a third layer of coloration Mm -hmm. so i i guess i think of production as being um about introducing nuance of light and shade and Mm -hmm. every bit of gear will give you something different to play with i mean you can do you can do all of this using eq but it's so much more fun when it's done by a piece of gear because you're not having to make those conscious logical choices, if that makes sense. I think I'm explaining that right. You, you know yeah. more about this than I do from the technical side. but No, I mean, no, like it does make sense. And I love the way that you describe it, though, in terms of thinking about these textures. I mean, I, I've done a whole podcast episode on texture and production, and I think it's so important that you don't just kind of get hung up on technical jargon. Um, Although I know that, you know, you you absolutely know what you're talking about, Catherine, but you also have your way of understanding what it is that you're you're listening for in what you're making. Well, at the end of the day, all this technical jargon is merely there to talk about a creative process. So I kind mm. of have learned and unlearned it because it's of no use to me in a te- in a creative environment. It's mm-hmm. like I need yeah. the vocabulary of, of someone creative. Yeah. It's like I don't. I can list the names of the preamps, but that's telling you nothing about what they do. Yeah. I'd rather talk about a preamp as being coloured or uncoloured, mm. or warm mm. or harsh. Mm. Um, and it's just so much more like for somebody else coming into the world that you're trying to make as an artist, it's so much easier to walk into that world with you, you know, when you describe it in that way. Yeah, like I, I was working on track the other day and I'd forgotten that I'd recorded and I always write down the chain whenever I record anything. And I just it just wasn't working for me. And I couldn't, no matter how much I EQ'd it and fiddled with it, I just didn't like the vocal. And then I realized it was because I recorded with the Gemini mic, but I recorded through an API 512, which I would never use for a vocal normally. And I, what possessed me to do it that day? I have no idea. But it sounded shit is the only that's a terrible <laughs> term it sounded like a bag of shit uh, it was too harsh and no amount of eqing is going to take away that coloration so i think if you're experimenting if you're a beginner with preamps you're better off not using something because you can't mm-hmm. take it out after it's there yeah. you better try and yeah. put it on afterwards but if once you get to know your signal chain it can be a really quick way of creating 
a rich, characterful palette of sound that sounds mm. professional as well, mm. as well. And you don't have to pay a massive amount of money. Like I say, a big fan of the Golden Age Project preamps that are super cheap um, mm. and easy to use. Um, yeah. And I know loads of producers who started out with those and still have them in their, in their studios as well. That's really, really great. It's, it's great to not just hear those three microphones, which I'm going to link to all of those in the show notes, but also that kind of extra little inside tip from you about preamps. And I know for a lot of people that will be um, really, just really great to have that as a starting point to go and explore it further. But don't spend all your money on preamps like I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, if if you want to, then... <laughs> start with the golden age for it if you yeah it. start with the golden age um thank you so much Catherine, for your time it's been so great to chat with you on the podcast oh it's a pleasure i hope i haven't been too negative but i think it's important to be honest about you know sharing your experiences that you've had and i, I guess it's a little bit like lessons to my younger self you know things that i wish i had known um and it feels like the industry's shifting fast beneath our feet but it's not mm-hmm. shifting fast enough when you kick it up the arse a little bit well dear listener wasn't that just such an interesting discussion with Catherine? i loved how open and candid she was about her experiences in the industry and also about the things that she'll do differently moving forward what really shines through is just how vital and healing it has been for her as a woman in music to not only have recording and production skills but to also create a home recording space that's just for her and somewhere she feels safe to experiment with recording and production. It's something so many of us don't give ourselves permission to do, but it's such a game changer, not just in practical terms. There's no doubt it massively speeds up the process of recording and sharing your music, but also in how you show up as a musician. You can hear just how strongly Catherine believes in her right to direct her creative vision and take ownership of her career, while working with the right team who support her in this too, and giving herself the skills and space to do this is crucial. This is about taking yourself seriously, dear listener, as a musician and someone who just deserves to explore and express their creative voice as well. It's important not to be totally disheartened as a woman in music on hearing some of the negative experiences Catherine shared today, although I get it if you do. But instead, I invite you to use these experiences as confirmation that you already have everything you need inside of you. You just need to listen to your gut and find mentors and collaborators who are truly supportive. Take Catherine's advice, don't buy into the idea that you need a massive team or a record deal to be valid as a musician. When you take responsibility for your own development by investing in your skills and steering your own ship, that's when you make the transition into being a professional musician and magical things can happen. And if you're listening to this episode as it goes out live and Catherine's got you all fired up to learn how to make cleaner, crisper, more professional home recordings of your music from home, I have just the thing for you, dear listener. I'm running a free five-day challenge exclusively for female musicians called Clean Up Your Recordings, You Dirty Girl. And I think you're going to love it. From the 17th to the 21st of September, I'll be going live every day with practical and actionable recording techniques inside the female-only pop-up challenge community, which, by the way, is probably the most encouraging and supportive music tech space you'll have ever encountered. If your recordings could do with a little bit of a clean-up, you can grab your place on the waitlist at femalediymusician.com forward slash challenge. This will mean you'll lock in your spot inside the challenge and get all the updates you'll need to take part and join me inside. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash challenge and I'll meet you inside to give your home recordings a good old clean up. And if you loved this episode with Catherine today, I think you're going to love next week's too because inside I'm giving you the lowdown on why you shouldn't leave recording and producing your music to the experts. 
I hear so many female musicians tell me how they don't believe they should self-record and produce their music because clearly there's plenty of people out there who know so much more than them and who would do a better job. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a reasonable argument. Of course, someone with a degree in audio engineering will know so much and could be wonderful to work with. But it doesn't mean it's the only way or even the best way to record your music. So if waiting for the experts to come along has left you wondering when and how you'll ever get your music recorded, join me next week to find out the powerful mindset hack that will turn this on its head and the crucial question you actually need to be asking. But till then, take care, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Girls Twiddling Knobs is hosted and produced by me, Isabel Anderson, with production support from Francesca O'Connor, and is a female DIY musician production. Just before you take out your earbuds and go off and do whatever it is you're going to do next, dear listener, make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. I'd hate for you to miss any future episodes, especially any bonus ones we might release on the sly. Hit subscribe and thank me later. Right, I'll let you get on with your day now. Bye.